Hey, church fam, welcome back. Glad to have you here for another episode of Theology 101. We're continuing our, our series on Christology, who is Jesus? And today we're talking about the kenosis, what it is, is it biblical, and what do we need to avoid? Hey, I'm Randy Bond, pastor of Aviano Baptist Church, and thank you so much for joining us today as we look at this. The kenosis of Christ is one of those things that kind of uh, appears every now and then in conversation. It's kind of one of those in and out kind of doctrines that sometimes you don't hear a whole lot about it and sometimes you do. This is one that in recent years has kind of escalated up a little bit in part because of uh, Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson is the pastor of Bethel Church. And in a book of his, uh, When Heaven Invades Earth, he made a couple of statements in there that really raised some questions uh, about his doctrine, about his um, orthodoxy. Uh, now, this is just one area, and I, I would say I have zero recommendation of this book for you. I don't think that Bill, John is, Bill Johnson is a pastor worth listening to, worth following, worth reading. Uh, I think he's somebody that you do well to stay away from. Um, and this is part of the reason why. Now, let me clarify, he has since uh, kind of retracted or uh, restated some of these things uh, in a little bit more biblically orthodox way. Uh, so he stepped back on this, but there's still a whole lot of other problem areas that we don't have the time to get into today. But here is what he said in this book that really raised some eyebrows when it came to kenosis. Uh, so he said, uh, Jesus laid his divinity aside as he sought to fulfill the assignment given to him by the Father. So basically, the way that this is worded makes it sound like that when Jesus emptied himself, that he stopped being God, uh, that he did not come as um, uh, the God-man, as we saw in our last um, uh, session, our last episode on the hypostatic union and the humanity of Christ, uh, but it sounds like he came just only as a man. And just kind of to reemphasize that, what you see on page 29 is that Jesus performed miracles, wonders, and signs as a man in right relationship to God, not as God. If he performed miracles because he was God, then they would not uh, they would be unattainable for us. So there's a whole lot more again to Bill Johnson than this, but this was one of those things that kind of raised a lot of eyebrows about, is Bill Johnson really a biblical teacher? And again, that's kind of another topic, another day. Uh, but it, this all centered around this idea of kenosis. And kenosis is one of those uh, misunderstood terms. It's a Greek word. And so uh, we're going to look at that today. Uh, what is kenosis? Is it biblical? Uh, what are some of the things that we need to avoid uh, when we're talking about kenosis? And is it even really important? Uh, so let's first uh, talk about the definition. And again, it comes from the Greek word kanao. Uh, kanao means to empty. And that's the heart of the, the meaning of this definition is that there's an emptying, a taking out, a taking away of something. And that's what we need to try to clarify today. What is it that Jesus emptied himself of? And really, this only comes from one passage uh, in the entire New Testament. Um, and it's from Philippians 2.7 in particular. Um, and we're going to read that whole section here just so you have the, the full context. Uh, but this is important to take a look at. So starting in verse 5, Paul is addressing the Philippians and he's trying to encourage them uh, to be humble with each other, to be considerate of other people, uh, not thinking of their own selves, but to think of others as well. And so he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not ca uh, count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, clutched, uh, is the Greek wording there. Verse 7, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, before we go on, let me just mention, this is that point where we get that word kenosis, kanao, uh, in that he emptied himself. And I want you to pay attention to what it says that he emptied himself up. And it's not really a whole lot that we have in here. We're just told that he had that equality with God and that he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant. And I think that's the crucial point that we need to, to take away. And we'll look at that a little bit more as we go. 
So let's look on at the rest of the, the context here. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. So let's uh, take a look at some of the background, some of the theories uh, that, that have been out there. Uh, the first is what were known as the canonic uh, theologians, and these were in the 19th century, so in the 1800s. And this is where they they would say that he emptied himself of his divine attributes, uh, those things like omniscience, omnipresence, uh, omnipotence. Um, and so these kind of things, uh, he just completely left those behind in heaven when he took on human flesh. And really, this is what this is talking about. When God, when Jesus became a man, what did he empty himself of? And so the canonic theologians were saying it's his divine attributes. Um, and this is known as the functional canonic heresy, the, the functional meaning his abilities, those kind of things were left behind. Now, uh, the theory kind of ignores that Jesus does use his divine uh, attributes at some times. Uh, he uses his omniscience in John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Uh, this is when some of the people, after he turned the water into wine, uh, put their faith in him. But it says that Jesus didn't entrust himself to them because he knew what was in men's hearts. So without anyone having to tell him, he is aware, he's fully understanding of what is happening in the hearts and minds of human beings. So there is an omniscient aspect to Jesus that a normal human being does not possess. Uh, his omnipresence, and this one could be you know, questionable here, but maybe, just maybe we're seeing this, or maybe this is, again, an exercise of his omniscience in uh, John 1.48, uh, when he is uh, talking, I believe, to Nathaniel and says, look, you know, uh, before uh, we, we met, I, I saw you under the fig tree. And, you know, obviously he had not been there, uh, but there was something that he knew, he saw, he knew about him uh, before they even had their first face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, and then his omnipotence uh, in Luke 8, 22 through 25. And this is where Jesus calms the storm when they're out at sea. Uh, so he has this extreme power that he's able to exercise uh, seemingly of his own authority and ability uh, in doing that. The other uh, canonic theory that is really, really bad is that Jesus ceased to be God. And this is almost what it looks like that uh, maybe, maybe uh, Bill Johnson was referring to uh, because he talks about him just kind of being a man and right relationship to God and doing that. Maybe jo uh, Bill Johnson was talking about more of a functional sort of idea, but there has been floated this idea that Jesus ceased to be God, that he was God and stopped being God and just became a man. And we've already seen that this is not the case. Um, but this is known as the ontological uh, canonic uh, heresy. So if you want more about that, go back to uh, some of our uh, previous episodes or, or lessons on is Jesus God, is he uh, Jehovah, uh, and on the Trinity. And we'll, we'll see that this one really doesn't hold up. So then that kind of begs the question of, of what uh, did Christ empty himself? And here are a number of different possibilities for this. And they have varying levels of of credibility in this. So hang with me as we, we take a look. Um, so the first is his glory, or what might be called the insignia of majesty. And we see this in John 17, 5. And this would have been a temporary emptying. And I think this is where we're going to see some things may have been temporary, some things may have been permanent in what he emptied himself of. Uh, so we want to, to take a look here. Uh, in John 17, 5, it says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So here we see that Jesus is asking to be restored to glory that he possessed prior to his emptying. And I think this is probably one of the, the most likely candidate uh, for what Jesus emptied himself of, uh, that for the season of his incarnation for his earthly ministry. Let me let me put it more specifically that way, because as we saw in the incarnation, he still has a fleshly body even now. So that's a permanent thing. Uh, but the 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 aspect of him having that full display of the go glory prior to the resurrection uh, was something that was diminished, uh, something that was uh, willingly, voluntarily left behind. 
uh, so that he could do it, but it's something that he has now. So he had it before, stopped having it for a while, and has that now yet again. Uh, so this would have been a temporary emptying of that particular aspect. The other thing is that we we could possibly see here an unlimited uh, the the unlimited or independent use of his divine attributes for his own benefit. Now this is not saying that he had no divine attributes like the functional canonic heresy. Uh, that that is not at all what we're saying because we do see him exercising uh, his omniscience. Um, several times. Uh, we do see him exercising omnipotence several times. So it's more this idea of the unlimited uh, or independent use of those divine attributes. Uh, and this was, again, a temporary emptying, a temporary uh, kenosis event. Um, and here's some examples. So in his um, limiting of his omnipresence, um, for example, Jesus had to travel from one place to another. He was limited in time and space to a particular point, uh, particularly in space, and he had to travel physically from one space to another, either by land, by water, uh, but this was something that Jesus had to physically do. So there, we can see that there was at least a limiting uh, of this. Uh, his omniscience um, in Mark 13, 32, uh, this is when he says that no one knows, um, you know, the, 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 end, the date of the end of the world, not even the son of man, uh, he says. Uh, so this may be a, a, a voluntary, uh, temporary uh, limiting of that divine uh, attribute or the independent use of that attribute. And then his omnipotence, uh, we can say in John 4, 7, uh, that he is uh, tired. Uh, this is at the uh, account of the woman at the well uh, in Samaria. He's tired, he's resting, he's thirsty, um, and he doesn't have a bucket uh, to lift water out. Uh, so maybe he could have done that um, and did not because of the needed encounter with the, the, the Samaritan woman. Uh, but it may be at the, just that limiting of his omnipotence to satisfy his thirst, independent of a means of a bucket or something like that. Um, the third way that we can see that, that kenosis in action uh, may be his uh, equality with the father. Uh, so he has a... a given up that functional equality. Jesus is still fully uh, divine. Um, he is uh, uh, co-equal with God, um, co-eternal, uh, co-existent with him, uh, but he takes a subordinate role. And we see this particularly like in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 28, Philippians 2, 6, and Matthew 20, 28. Uh, and it seems that Jesus permanently gave up his functional uh, equality with the Father to save us. So this is a huge thing that Jesus did in emptying himself. And again, I, I want to say we want to be careful about how we define this because it's only found in Philippians 2.7, and there's not a lot uh, that's given to that, but I think that we can put some other clues in Scripture together to kind of understand what this is. So this one has uh, some you know high uh, possibility, probability, that this is part of that kenosis. Uh, this would be in, within the realm of biblical possibility. Um, and, and this is certainly what we see as uh, Jesus doing and functioning even now, that he has that subordinate role to the Father. Uh, also, uh, his non-corporeal existence. Uh, this is uh, one of the ways that we see that Jesus has uh, limited himself in, in some respects uh, in giving up his uh, purely spiritual existence like the Father and the Holy Spirit still possess today. Uh, there is no point in Scripture uh, where we are told that at the ascension or any point thereafter, Jesus ceased to have a physical body. Now, I know some people believe that, uh, but there, there's no biblical evidence for that statement. Uh, so as we see in Luke 10, 5, uh, that, you know, a body you have prepared for me is uh, what, what Jesus is, is saying and quoting that. Uh, so we, we see that Jesus took on flesh. It was really flesh, uh, that he really physically rose from the grave and that he really physically ascended into heaven. And there's no evidence that he uh, has given that up because we also believe that Jesus is going to physically bodily return to earth. Uh, so I don't think that there's a point of the body somehow disappearing or him taking that off and then putting that on at a later point when he returns. So that non-corporeal existence, uh, meaning without a body, 
um, is a permanent thing that he may have given up. So let's take a quick look at the, the diagram of this passage. Um, and I think that this may help us just a little bit here. Forgive the crude aspect of it. Uh, so we see that Jesus has that equality with God. His action, that step down there, is that he empties himself uh, and he takes on the form of a man. Uh, and that he humbles himself, uh, taking the form of a servant, the obedient man. He becomes obedient to death, even to death on the cross. So that ultimate degradation, uh, the, the cruelty of the cross, um, just being stripped down to nakedness and, and exposed to all of humanity. However, because he has done that, God has exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. And as we've seen, that name is Jehovah. Jesus is, in fact, Jehovah. He's worshiped as Jehovah. You can go back and see one of our previous episodes, Is Jesus Jehovah? So I think the, the clearest thing that we can see uh, that, that Jesus emptied himself of is his glory. The glory that he had before uh, when he is just fully existing with God, as God, uh, never ceased to be God. Let's be clear on that. Uh, but that he he emptied himself of that glory and that honor, the majesty, uh, all those things that would have been rightfully due him in order to take on our sin um, and to, uh, to, to accomplish salvation for us. And so because he has done that, God has elevated him back to that, exalted him back to that previous place of glory that he had before he emptied himself. Uh, so again, this is just one of those, um, those important doctrines in scripture, but it's based really on one word and one verse. And so it's one of those uh, doctrines that we need to be careful about, uh, that we're not adding too much definition uh, when there's not a whole lot. Now we can look at the whole council of scripture to, to better understand of what that means. And I think some of those other things that we pointed to are certainly within the, that realm, but the clearest one that we can come away with, and because of the context of the passage, this is what I think it means. Um, it clearly in Ephesians, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, again, Paul is exhorting the Philippian believers and anyone else who would read that letter to be like Jesus, that even though we may have position, power, authority, honor, that we willingly lay that aside in order to serve one another, in order to uh, to, to accomplish our gospel mission here on planet earth. So in the same way that Jesus laid aside humbly his glory, that we lay aside whatever semblance of glory uh, or thought of glory that we might have and that we would become the most humble of humbles and that we would uh, take on the attitude of Jesus. Uh, as he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So an important doctrine, we need to make sure that we get it right, and we need to be careful when we're doing that. Uh, but it is uh, one that we see just one more aspect of the nature of Jesus, who he is, and how awesome he is that he would leave the glory aside in order to bring that for us. May his name be forever praised. May every knee indeed bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, I hope this was helpful. If it was, please uh, just give us a like and, and let us know that. If you have questions, you can leave those in the comments below and would be glad to try to help you out with those uh, if I can. Uh, God bless and we'll see you next time.